Hi there! Today I'll be discussing left bundle branch blocks and how to apply the Scarbosa criteria. As required by the UC Davis School of Medicine, I have no financial disclosures. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge Tom Butele, a paramedic firefighter captain with the Hilton Head Island Fire Rescue Department. He is the editor of the EMS 12 lead blog, and without his help, I don't think I would ever know about the Scarbosa criteria and be pretty ignorant about this entire subject altogether. So thank you, Tom. So let's begin with some normal anatomy. This is a picture of the heart electrical conduction system. A normal heartbeat will start in the SA node, travel down the internodal pathways, pause slightly in the AV node, then go down the left and right bundle branches through the bundle of His to depolarize the right and left ventricle. In left bundle branch block anatomy, we see that the left bundle branch is affected by a blockage. This can be caused by acute conditions such as a new heart attack or an acute myocardial infarction, or possibly a chronic condition such as aortic stenosis, cardiomyopathy, and other pathological conditions that have been there for quite some time. In this particular situation, we have the electrical conduction system again starting in the SA node, going down the internodal pathways, pausing at the AV node, going down into the bundle of His, but because of the blockage, the signal, the electrical signal, does not travel down the left bundle branch. Instead, it goes down only the right bundle branch. Once the right bundle branch is depolarized, it will start to depolarize the left ventricle using cell-to-cell -cell communication. This leaves us with a very interesting electrical signal, which is entirely almost towards the left side of the heart. I want you to keep in mind this picture of this red arrow because we'll be coming back to it to highlight the direction of the electrical signal moving primarily to the left. When you're looking at an EKG, the findings for left bundle branch block include a QRS that is wide, specifically longer than 0.12 seconds. At precordial lead V1, the QRS should normally be quite negative and broad. The precordial lead V6 should be positive and broad. And we will also note something really important, known as the secondary repolarization changes. Here, we should see that the QRS complex should be discordant with the ST segment. We'll discuss this more in depth later because this is a very important concept. Let's go e over each one of these criteria. First, we'll look at the QRS being longer than 0.12 seconds. This should be seen in pretty much any lead. And so it doesn't matter which lead we're looking at in these two examples that I have here. 0.12 seconds, if you can't do math like me, is about three small boxes since each box is 0.04 seconds across horizontally. So three small boxes equals 0.12 seconds. Anything longer than that, and we're thinking left bundle branch block. Just to show you on the PowerPoint, this small line represents three small boxes according to the scale on the left and the right examples. These are two examples of EKGs found in left bundle branch block. Again, it doesn't really matter what lead we're at. It just needs to be longer than 0.12 seconds. And if I put my marker down on the left EKG, you can see it is longer. And also on the right, the QRS is also longer than 0.12 seconds. So when we see this, we're already thinking the potential of the left bundle branch block. The next criteria we're going to look at deals specifically with the precordial lead V1. In this case, the QRS complex is mostly negative and is wide. We're not surprised that it's wide. We just discussed that ignore QRS should be longer than 0.12 seconds. But because the precordial lead is on the right side, we expect the electrical signal to be moving away from it in left bundle branch block. And that's why we see this predominantly negative signal. Again, if we want to look at our arrow, the main electrical signal is moving towards the left side, away from the electrode V1, and that's why we see that negative deflection. In this example, number one, 
we see a QS wave, which is entirely negative. Let's take a look at another example here. In this example, the QRS complex is also predominantly going down, and is also a QS wave because there is no upward deflection. In this example, we see that the QRS again is mostly going down, but there's a slight tiny upstroke in the initial part of the QRS complex. And so it doesn't matter. In the end, this QRS is mostly negative, it's going down, and so then we're also thinking left bundle branch block. In this case, we'll be calling this a small r s wave. Even though we have this tiny little r, um, it's not significant enough to affect our criteria of saying that this is mostly negative. Some people think of the precordial lead V1 as a wheel when looking at the QRS. This seems a little strange, but bear with me. The idea being that when the QRS points downwards, it's like turning the wheel to the left. And therefore, we suspect left bundle branch block. If we saw a positive QRS in lead V1, the wheel would be turned to the right, and we would suspect right bundle branch block. Okay, so let's now move on to the next left bundle branch block criteria. In this case, we'll be looking at specifically precordial lead V6. Remember, lead V6 is the leftmost electrode on our chest. In this case, we expect the QRS to be completely positive as well as being bored. So you can see in this example, we have a very positive QRS complex in lead V6. This makes sense because, remember, due to that cell-to-cell -cell communication, the electrical signal is moving pretty much all the way to the left. And that's moving towards the electrode, and that's why we have a positive QRS complex. In this example, we have a small r, big r prime wave, and remember, there's no negative deflection in this particular QRS example. The second example, just demonstrating this again, shows um, another case where the QRS complex is completely positive. In this case, it is just an R wave. There is no smaller R, so it's just a big R wave. And in this example here, the scale is slightly smaller, but you can see that the QRS complex is completely positive, and therefore it is again a R wave. The key point to remember about left bundle branch block is that we expect discordance, specifically discordance between the QRS complex and the ST segment. What does that even mean? Well, it means that if the QRS complex is pointing up, we expect the ST segment should be pointing down. Also, this means that we should see the opposite true. So if the QRS complex is pointing down, which we normally see in the leads V1, V2, and V3, the XD segment should be pointing up. This is a hard concept to try to remember. So I'm Asian. I think about yin and yang all the time. So opposites in this case is good. So SD segment goes up. We want QRS complex to go down as well as vice versa. Think of it as good and evil black and white balance. So in this particular case, this person is balancing good and bad. You, you want the QRS up. You want the ST segment down. In this particular case, this discordance is good. Also keep in mind that the reverse is true. The ST segment is up. We expect the QRS to be down. So discordance in left bundle branch block is a good sign. Let's go over a couple of examples here. In the lead one example, we can see that the QRS complex is positive and the ST segment is indeed negative, so there's discordance. In lead V1, the center example, we have a negative QRS and then a positive ST segment. Again, good discordance. In lead V6, we see a positive QRS and a negative ST segment, meeting again our criteria for discordance. Remember, discordance is good. All right, let's now move on to Scarbosa criteria. Scarbosa criteria is used when we suspect a patient might have acute myocardial infarction with a left bundle branch block. As you know, patients with AMI can benefit from interventional cardiology and potentially thrombolytic medications, one of the two. And so identifying these patients as quickly as possible can be quite can be critical in preserving heart muscle. 
So why do we need Scarbosa criteria? Well, as we've learned before, left bundle branch block can actually normally cause ST segment elevation even when there is no acute MI. So in this case, we see an ST segment, and if you were just um, looking at a STEMI patient, you would think that this patient meets STEMI criteria, but in fact, there is no acute myocardial infarction. Scorposal criteria allows us to predict acute myocardial infarction even when there's a left bundle branch block. The three criteria for AMI with left bundle branch block is a little intimidating at first, but we'll go over it step by step. The three criteria is, first, that there is ST segment elevation of one millimeter or greater concordant with the QRS direction in any lead, ST segment depression of one millimeter or greater in leads V1, V2, or V3, or ST segment elevation of five millimeters or greater discordant with QRS direction in any lead. So let's go over each of these criteria one at a time. All right, so the first Scarbosa criteria we'll look at allows us to look at any lead. In this case, what we're looking for is ST segment elevation of one millimeter or greater, and the QRS is in the same direction as the ST segment, otherwise known as being concordant. So let's take a look at example A here. When we take a look at this picture, there's some obvious ST segment elevation right there. So we want to ask ourselves, is it one millimeter or greater? I have a handy little one millimeter box here, this little orange box. If I put it down, you can clearly see, yes, there is definitely ST segment elevation. Now the question is, is it concordant with the QRS? Indeed it is. The QRS is pointed upwards, and there's ST segment elevation. It's also pointed upwards, so they are concordant. This is a red flag. Let's move to example B here. In this example, we see ST segment elevation off the bat, right here. We, it's greater than one millimeter. And the QRS complex is positive, so it's in the same direction as the elevation. It's pointed up, there's ST segment elevation. Again, the criteria in this case is met. Let's look at one more example. We see ST segment elevation right here. It is greater, or at least a, a, about one millimeter. The QRS complex is pointing upwards. So again, concordance is present. Remember, in this case, concordance is bad. When we see the QRS in the same direction as the ST segment elevation, that is not a good sign. And we'll discuss this further on applying the Scarbosa criteria and predicting AMI. Okay, so let's move on to the next Scarbosa criteria. In this case, we're looking specifically at precordial leads V1, V2, and V3. Now, in these three leads, we normally expect the QRS complex to be negative because, as we remember, the electrical signal moves away. So the electrical signal moves to the left, it moves away from these three electrodes, and so we expect the QRS to be negative. When we look at these three leads and we see ST segment depression of one millimeter or greater, this is a disconcerting finding. So let's take a look at this first example. We have ST segment depression right there. And with my handy one millimeter box, we can see clearly it is one greater than one millimeter. We'll also know, incidentally, that the QRS complex is pointing down. So if you actually notice, this is concordant. The criteria doesn't actually say, when you look at these leads, you're looking for concordance, but it turns out to be the case. Concordance in these leads, V1, V2, and V3, is again an ominous finding. We're worried about acute myocardial infarction because of this particular finding. Let's take a look at the next example. In this case, we see SC segment depression. It is greater than one millimeter, and the QRS complex is pointing down. So again, we see concordance. One more example. We see the ST segment depression. It's greater than one millimeter, and it's in one of the leads V1, V2, or V3, so it turns out to be concordant with the ST segment depression. So again, the key finding here is concordance is bad. QRS complex is in the same direction as the ST segment depression. So QRS is pointed down, there's ST segment depression. 
Let's take a look at the third criteria. In the third criteria, this is for any lead, so we don't need to look at any lead in particular. But what we're looking for is ST segment elevation 5 millimeters or greater, and the QRS complex is in the opposite direction, so discordant. We know we talked about discordance being good previously, and we'll get to the how to remember this is this third criteria, but let's take a look at this example. We have a ST segment elevation, and we have a discordant QRS, so the QRS is pointed down, and normally we would expect that that's okay, but in this case, the ST segment elevation is five millimeters or greater, and that's excessive. So take a look, this, is, this ST segment is much higher than five millimeters, and so this is what's known as excessive discordance, and this is what the third Scarbosa criteria is looking at. This is what we're worried about. Let's take a look at another example here. So we have an ST segment elevation, we have a discordant QRS, it's pointed downwards, so normally we would think, oh, that's, that's probably a, a reassuring finding. But when we apply the 5 millimeter rule to it, this SD segment is much higher. And so we have, again, excess discordance. And then let's take a look at this example. It almost didn't fit on the EKG paper. We have SD segment elevation, a negative QRS, so it's discordant. And then we realize it's a very, very high ST segment, so really a very, very excess discordance there, if that's even a real word to describe it. So again, we talked about discordance being good and you have good balance, and in this case, you can think of maybe the yin-yang being disrupted. So we have way too much discordance, so too much of a good thing can be bad too, right? So we have really disrupted things, and when we have excessive ST segment elevation, we disrupt the balance and there's a disturbance in the force. So maybe that will help some people remember it, but excess discordance is, is not a good thing. So what are you going to do if you have a patient who meets one or more of the Scarbosa criteria? Actually, as it turns out, each one of the criteria has varying levels of accuracy in predicting acute myocardial infarction in the, in the setting of left bundle branch block. So each criteria is assigned a score. In the 1996 paper, which described Scarbosa criteria, for an accurate diagnosis, a specificity of 90% requires a minimal total score of 3. So let's look at the three criteria again and see how the Scarbosa criteria assigns scores to each of the following. The first criteria we looked at was ST segment elevation of one millimeter or greater concordant with the QRS direction, so pointed up, the QRS is pointed upwards. In this case, this was found to be the strongest predictor and is assigned five points. When we are looking at the ST segment depression of leads V1, V2, or V3, if we had one millimeter or greater of ST segment depression, that was assigned three points. The last criteria we looked at when ST segment elevation was greater than or equal to what, five millimeters, discordant with the QRS, so excess discordance, this was actually found to be the weakest predictor and was assigned only two points. So if you found a patient that only had excess discordance, five millimeter or greater ST segment elevation discordant with the QRS complex, so the QRS complex is pointing down, that actually turns out to be the weakest predictor of the three. And so the Scarbosa paper states that a score of two, where you only have excessive discordance, should probably undergo further testing. So that's what the paper says. Now this specific inaccuracy or a lack of utility of this last criteria by itself has been explored by other researchers, and one of the more popular is the Smith Modified Scarbosa Criteria. The Smith, in this case, refers to Dr. Stephen Smith. He is actually a very popular blog writer that discusses some very interesting EKG cases, and so I encourage you highly to visit his blog at some point to learn more. Um, but in this case, the Smith Modified Scarbosa Criteria instead of looking at the excessive discordance height, looks at a ratio of excessive discordance. So if there is a ratio above a certain number between the ST segment and QRS complex, it's considered a good predictor of acute myocardial infarction in the setting of left bundle branch block. I won't be going over this particular criteria because it wasn't in the original 1996 paper by Scarposa et al. Right, so in summary, in a patient with left bundle branch block 
without acute myocardial infarction, we expect to see a white QRS complex, a negative broad QRS complex in precordial lead V1, a positive broad QRS complex in precordial lead V6, and we expect discordance between the QRS complex and the ST segment. So if the QRS is pointed up, we expect the ST segment to be pointing down, and vice versa. When we have a patient with left bundle branch blocks and acute myocardial infarction, we can apply Scarbosa criteria to see if we can predict acute myocardial infarction. In this particular case, we're looking for ST segment elevation in the same direction as the QRS in any of the leads, so concordance of one millimeter or greater, ST segment depression in leads V1, V2, or V3, which is again concordance of at least one millimeter or greater, and then also noting excess discordance, so very poor ST segment elevation discordant with the QRS complex, so the QRS complex is pointed down. And just to wrap up, I just want to show you the articles that were referenced in this presentation. So the Scarbosa paper was published in the New England Journal of Medicine 1996, and the uh, Smith-modified Scarbosa criteria was published as an abstract in circulation in 2008.